Welcome to a soccer down here 1v1 where we're catching up with the Atlanta United Academy director, Matt Lowry, and we get to talk about a bunch of different things. Talk about guys that he gets to keep an eye on, talk about the twos, talk about graduation, talk about what's going to the next level. And also, but Matt, I wanted to start off with uh, another venture that's going on right now at the Academy, and it's the U19s in the UPSL. And what's it like seeing the U19s involved in that league, which is weekly competition all the way through the summer and fall? Yeah, no, it's really exciting. First of all, John, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Um, but the 19s is a funny age group. Um, for us, the players that go into college from our academy are massively important. You see Match Up Chol come back after four years at Wake Forest. You see Bryce Washington come back. Um, so these guys that go to school, we keep tabs on. We bring back in the summer, and we know that they're going to be you know, different player, a more mature player coming out. So that pathway for us is, is really important. And the U19 age group is funky because a lot of other MLS academies don't have that 19s age group. So it puts us competitively at a disadvantage. It's tough to play other teams, and we end up um, having to spend a lot of money and doing a lot of travel with this 19 group. Um, but the focus for them, a lot of it is, can we get them into college? Can we get them into a really good four year in a, uh, university and then, then follow along? So I got speaking to Graham Walsh, who's the president over at UPSL. Um, it's a newer league, but it's a really cool league. Um, you know, a little more localized in terms of their divisions, not a ton of travel, but for our 17, 18 year olds, great competition, um, and playing men, 25, 26 year old guys that are post-college and, and that kind of competitive balance is what we wanted so badly. So we're really excited. We did really well in the first game, um, but Augusta was an amazing host, and, and we're excited for hosting our first game tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, here at the training ground. So, yeah, we're stoked. It's going to be a really good environment for those guys. And since you've been reading my notes, that was going to be my next question, was you're seeing these U19s going up against adults. I mean, dudes who are – 25, 26, mid 20s, guys who still want to try and find that next contract. And so I think that in that in between age group, the fact that they're still getting reps against older competition, I think can only serve them better. And especially to continue to get those game reps, it just seems to be that that added element of it with the older competition. You're hundred percent right. For us, it's sometimes just a math equation with our 13 year olds. We want them playing 14 year olds. We want our 15 year olds playing 16, 17 year olds. We just went to Wilmington, North Carolina with a U14 team and a U16 team. And they played against U15, U17 and the 16 played against U17, U19 teams. So for us, it's always challenging them in that way um, because our kids learn a lot when they can't win the game physically, then they have to turn to how do I win this game? Technically, how do I outthink the opponent? That's where we want to stretch our kids. And again, that U19 group has been tough because generally speaking, they are the top echelon of, of youth soccer. We can't play older. Um, it's hard to play college teams. They have their own NCAA rules to, to deal with. So this was kind of that really good, we're able to play our kids up against competitive, um, older guys, adult guys. Um, and it, it just worked perfectly. So obviously first year, there's going to be some kinks, um, but we're really excited about it. And I think it's going to be a good process for those boys. So then as an academy director, let me ask you about expectations for this team in this league, because I know that a lot of folks will gravitate toward the notion of wins and losses and winning games and winning divisions and going deep in playoff runs. But it's something that we've also noticed with Atlanta United, too, where Yes, wins are important, and there's a conjunction in that sentence. You want the growth to be there as well. Is it the same thing? I mean, what are the expectations, I guess, from a wins and losses perspective as you're trying to continue to hone the craft of the U19s? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's a really interesting balance. I think what we always say around the office is it's, it's not about winning. It's about trying with everything to win. And, and making sure that our players are giving it all. I mean, that's really what's key. Um, and we don't want our young players to, you know, if they do raise to the point where they're with the first team, their first championship game shouldn't be the MLS Cup. Their first playoff game shouldn't be an MLS. They should be getting really, really highly competitive um, games that stretch them as younger players. But as you said, it's, it's not the end-all be-all. The wins and losses is not where we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves in player development. Who's pushing through? 
um, who's really starting to, to get involved in the first team, who is Gonzalo Pineda and Carlos Bocanegra going, whoa, what a player. Um, that's where we really get excited about what we do on a day-to-day basis. Um, so our coaches uh, understand that. Every day, you know, the message to the players is give everything. You know, leave everything out on the pitch. Um, do your best to win and compete. But regardless of what that scoreline is afterwards, it's okay. Back to work. Here's where you need to get better. Here's your player review. Here's some videos that are going to help you. And let's get back to work on Monday. Um, and that's just how we operate on a week-to-week basis. When you see that player and the light comes on after all of the work that has gone into this, all of the the on-the-field training, all of the film work, all of the study that comes in a bunch of different ways, regardless of age, when you see that light come on for that player, What's that like for you as a director and for the club and the coaching staff to see, hey, they're really improving here and they're getting what we're trying to get to here? It's the moment we live for as, as youth coaches. I mean, I, we're, we really live in the shadows. You know, the, the light for us, the, the podium for us, or is, that's for the players. You know, it's not for us as youth coaches. We want to kind of give them everything. So our moment is, as you said, you, you put it perfectly. When that light bulb goes off for a player and you see them go, oh, now I get it. Now I can improve my game in this little detail that coach has been hammering me at for six months. That's where we really get excited. But then it, it, it becomes, OK, what's next? Um, and, and then that's, you know, the players don't get a rest in that way. As soon as they kind of cross a boundary and get to a certain challenge and have success, it's immediately great. We're pushing you up in age group. We're pushing you in the 19s to play with the UPSL. We're pushing you into USL with Jack Collison. Maybe you can train with, with the first team in, in Gonzalo Pineda. Um, But it's always great. You did it. Congratulations. Now it's the next challenge. Now get on with it. Um, It's great for us as coaches to see growth like that. You always love it, but then you immediately have to go, okay, what's next? Um, And and that's where the real fun begins. And what's next for Jason and myself and Jared, as we cover it, you know, Atlanta United two on a regular basis, when it comes to the the team in the USL championship, you're seeing Academy players, who are 15 and 16 years old, once again, like we were talking about with the U19s and the UPSL, they're lining up against professional athletes. I mean, dudes who are on the north end of 30, who this is their paycheck and they're making whatever it is they're making. This is their livelihood. And they're standing there on their own. And I think that that speaks well for what you guys in the academy are doing. And One of the names in the most recent sense that stands out when it comes to Atlanta United 2, I'll just say Caleb Wiley off the top of my head. When you have a Caleb Wiley who is not afraid of his surroundings, is not intimidated by what he's going into, and he's going up against probably the one of the the top forwards of a team that's going to come to fifth third or going on the road to take all that responsibility, you're seeing guys And I guess that, and this is what the academy is trying to build, is that process of, okay, well, that first wave, they might have been 17 or 18, and they're getting involved in it. Now you're seeing folks 15 and 16, and it's that progression that you're seeing, the steps-by-steps where the younger guys who are further along than that first wave, they're a part of the process too. And we're seeing that with guys like Caleb right now with Atlanta United too. Yeah, it's exciting. I think the reality with this academy, and, and we really owe it all to Tony Annan, um, who I'm, I'm doing my, my best to live in his big shoes, but he did an incredible job of starting this academy from scratch. Obviously, a guy that knew Georgia so well, knew the Southeast so well, was already proven as a youth coach, and, and what he did in the very beginning to get these top quality players in and to have these good relations in the city, because at the end of the day, we can't operate if we don't have great youth clubs around us to to help and support us and, and, and to, to push players on. But what we're seeing now is, is five years of hard work. Um, Caleb Wiley was one of our first U12 kids. That was the first youngest team that we ever started, the 2004 age group. Efrain Morales was in that group as well. Um, some of the young O5s that have shown up for USL recently, Daniel Sabatu, Jonathan Vial, also in that U12 mix. So it's great for us because now we have kids that have been in our program for four or five years. Um, and again, it's not that we know everything, but it gives us a great blueprint to look back on and go, okay, well, what did we do with Caleb Wiley? Why did we push him up at this age? Why did we keep him in age at this age? What, did, what video work did we do? Um, and having that process in front as a little bit of a blueprint, there's things we can improve and we're going to continue to do that. But the players that make it, 
Now we have an idea of the process that works for them. Every player is different. Every pathway is going to be different. But as an academy and as putting process in place in terms of curriculum, when teaching certain things, um, when to give kids a break, when to back off, when to push, when to challenge, it gets better every day. And, and it's kids like Caleb that we're really excited about. I don't know how high, uh, how high he'll be able to go, but right now he's, he's doing really excellent and still only 16 years old. So the sky's the limit for him, we think. But it's an exciting process. Well, and that was going to be my next question because there are times when, and I'll use the baseball term, you'll see uh, academy players get a cup of coffee with the Atlanta United too. We've seen Daniel Sabatu and we've seen him contribute. We've seen uh, you know Johnny Vial come in and seen him contribute. It's a delicate balance trying to get the feedback and at the same time have them continue to grow. What, what's that like as a director to try to sit there and say, okay, I can put, I can push the gas pedal a little bit. Okay. Now I need to push the clutch in and hit the brake and change gears a little bit. How difficult is that to gauge when to hit the gas and when to hit the brake for these guys? It's, 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 it's everything. It's really everything. And, and to say that it's, it's difficult is an understatement because again, every player is different. Um, we're really big on getting to know the parents. We're really big on getting to know the family. We're really big on getting to know everything that surrounds this kid because their environment is a big piece of them. Um, and the second piece is experience, you know, and, and that's, I want to speak again on, on Tony and how much experience he brought to it. And I was just able to pick something from him every day um, and hopefully to continue with that experience. But the ability to walk out onto a session, you know, see a kid who's really excelling, okay, when is the right time to push him up? And, and you spoke about the, the cup of coffee. It's, it's a perfect analogy because we think that first you got you to gotta see it. You know, Daniel wasn't in USL every single day. Now he's back with the 17s, improving on his craft. But we wanted him to have a taste. We wanted him to know what it was like to, as you said, compete against guys that are literally out there for a paycheck. It's a different world. Um, so we wanted them to have a taste. You saw Caleb Wiley get the taste probably a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, and now that's his life. USL is, is where he spends his day. And, and he's even starting to pop into first team training here and there a little bit as well. So it's, again, it's, it's feeding them, giving them that taste. How do they do? How do they react? Making sure that you have a good relationship with them where they're not lying to you. Um, you know, if they have a bad time with it or they, they you know, get, get really struck by it and scared by it, we need to know that. Um, so it's, it's important to have relationships, important to know their environment, and really, really important that, that they get that taste before getting thrown straight in. What's the first lesson that Tony taught you that stuck? Oof, it have been five years ago. Um, well, I wasn't very well dressed back then, so he helped me with my fashion. Uh, <laughs> I think the first day I showed up in a crappy pair of shoes and he looked, took one look at it and asked me if I was, you know, going, going hiking later. So I knew that that wasn't the type of shoe to show up to the office. So that was big. But his, he taught me that every youth player needs to understand that whatever work ethic they put in, there's more, there's more to give. Um, and, and, you know, he's a tough coach. He gets into players. He lets them know when, when the expectation is dropping and it didn't matter if you were the best player on that team or a kid struggling, a new kid, an old kid, a kid he knew it didn't matter. It was always, this is the expectation guys push it, keep working harder. And, and if a kid showed up and wasn't willing to put the work in that day, they heard from Tony and it didn't matter again who they were. And I think in an academy like this, there are some special players, but that that special treatment never happens. These players are always treated the same. And, and Tony, that was a really powerful message right from the start. So then how has it changed? How has the sport changed and academies changed? Has it changed much in the last five years? Has it been an exponential growth when it comes to dealing with academies? How has this structure and this idea changed over the last five years, if at all? The biggest change is the DA. Um, obviously, when when coronavirus hit, we all went on lockdown. Um, the DA kind of pulled out at that time and MLS Next plopped in. It's very similar. Um, some different clubs here and there, um, but they, they're doing things a lot in the same way. Um, but obviously, MLS Next is going to build more around those MLS academies. Um, so, the, you know, we're, we're kind of the, the big emblem, the big badge in, in the southeast. Um, and so we want to, you know, host games here show that we're, we're doing right by MLS next and kind of put the league out there in the forefront. Um, so we feel a little bit of a piece of that puzzle in, in helping the league grow and helping the league move. 
Um, but to be honest, not a whole lot has changed within that. I think the biggest key that I always come back to is just the, the community relations. It's just the clubs in this city. That's, that's our lifeblood. Um, and they do an amazing job. Some of these clubs, just so many players, but there's still the ability to, to get out and teach and provoke and, and get these players developing and having amazing relationships with us. I mean, I get, I get phone calls, I get emails, this kid's doing great. Take a look at him. It's not the same everywhere else. There's, there's clubs in other, in other MLS environments that are not as willing. So, um, amazing relationships in the city, um, amazing clubs in the city, and we couldn't do it without them. So, you know, that isn't different in the last five years, but it's just something we need to understand is so important and continue to help those relationships and help those clubs grow as well. And you've also kind of developed into being the spoke in the wheel when it comes to the Southeast and with Atlanta United being where it is, then you're seeing all of the relationships continue to expand. You're seeing it in markets large and small with Nashville being added, Charlotte coming online. Then you go down, you're looking at Chattanooga and Greenville and Statesboro. All will be a part of MLS next. And Atlanta United seems to have hit that sweet spot of being the spoke and the wheel of all of this and almost representing the Southeast in its growth in that five-year period too. Yeah. I mean, we always want to represent the Southeast to the best of our abilities. And I, and I think, just speaking on Atlanta, I, I truly believe that we're one of the most diverse academies in the U.S. Um, when we roll our teams out, it's just all types of kids from all types of backgrounds. And I think there's a lot of power in that as well. Um, you know, there's nothing that goes into that in the scouting. That's just the beauty of the city that we're in. Um, but having that diversity is so powerful, especially when you start to move around the southeast. Every kid feels welcome. Um, and as we get into the older ages, we start to look and into some of the, the Alabama areas, the Statesboro areas that you mentioned, and, and our reach gets a little bit bigger as these teams get older and can move a little bit away from home um, or are willing to make that two hour drive one way. Um, and, and, and everyone feels welcome. Um, and that's a really cool part of, of just being in this city and, and representing this city is having that diversity. It's been awesome. So then my last question for you, and thanks for hanging out with us for this 1v1, since we looked back five years, let's do the crystal ball question and go forward five years. How would you like to see things continue to grow or evolve or expand when we're discussing Atlanta United and the Academy in the future? What's the crystal ball look like for you? That's an awesome question. And I think it's such a cool question as an American because 2026, the World Cup is here. Um, and obviously the whole world is going to kind of turn to the U.S. and Mexico and and that's where the land of soccer is going to be. Um, and we as Atlanta United want to definitely be one of the big clubs in that moment, not just in terms of our infrastructure. We have amazing facilities. Thank you, Mr. Arthur Blank, every day for this, but also making sure that we're developing human beings as well as players. I want to be able to point to, you know, our, our multitude of homegrowns that are affecting things at MLS level, the first team level, perhaps um, even in Europe at that time and, and really pushing the envelope there but also being to point at the tons of kids that we've sent to colleges, the tons of kids that are in the workplace and, and helping grow the game. Maybe they're coaching their, your kid's team at that time. Maybe they're just helping in the community. Um, maybe we help them get referee licenses along the way, coaching licenses along the way, but it's bigger than just the homegrowns. Um, and we want to make sure that we take care of every kid that comes through here, not just the most talented ones. So hopefully we can be an emblem of that um, in five years. It's, it's a big piece of the puzzle. Well, Matt, thanks for hanging out with us here for a 1v1 with uh, the recent news that came online with the U19s and the UPSL. I wanted to catch up with you about that, kind of pull the curtain back and let everybody know what the, the inner workings are because they see all of the young talent. And you look at Bellows, you look at Miles, you know, just if they're drafts, you look at Bellow, you look at George Campbell coming through, you look at Caleb Wiley and all this talent. And it's, it's great to go back to the beginning so folks can see what this process is like to where they see them every single day in each of these different steps. Thanks for hanging out with us for a 1v1. We'll be catching up and keeping an eye. Thanks so much, Sean. Appreciate the time.